topic of, of our morning panel is the impact and role of culture, tradition, and language in cross-border negotiations and international conflict. I am proud to introduce our panelists today. We're going to start with Professor John Barkey. And John is uh, one of the authors in the symposium issue, so thank you for, for uh, submitting the article. Uh, Professor Barkey is at the University of Hawaii, and he's been there since 1978. Prior to Hawaii, he was at, he, he was at the Wayne State University in Detroit. So he went from Detroit to Hawaii, and I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> But he teaches in the dispute resolution program, and I have to say I'm a fan of, of Professor Barkey's. He's such an innovative scholar and innovative teacher, and I think you'll understand more after his presentation. Um, he also is involved in training with Asian business people and, and executive programs. And unsurprisingly, Professor Barkey was chosen by the students and faculty at the University of Hawaii as the Outstanding Professor of the Year. So congratulations on that. My name's John Barkey. I'm going to be working with you on what I call cultural dimension interests. Um, we know about interests in negotiation, uh, and I'm going to try and give you kind of a cultural uh, viewpoint of that, and particularly how these may impact cross-cultural negotiations and dispute resolutions, and try and provide a, a framework. And ultimately, because I'm a professor, I'm going to assign you a little bit of homework. Um, in terms of things to look at in a moment. So that's what we're going to take a look at. And I want to start with the idea of the dance of negotiation. And, and uh, many of us who uh, are involved in the process of negotiation uh, talk about and use this phrase, the dance of negotiation. And at least, I don't know what it means to you, but to me, symbolically, it has to do with two or more people usually kind of involved in what I'll call a positional dance where they're moving back and forth on a dance floor, not necessarily going in a direct line, but trying to accomplish a variety of things. And I'm going to show you what I think a bit of dance may look like from different cultures. This is kind of the Anglo approach to dance. Um, two people doing a waltz. Um, this is Beijing or Chinese opera quite different approach to dance, different steps, different music, um, looking a little bit like war. This is the haka. Um, this is the Maori war chant uh, used at the introduction of rugby football games <laughs> by the New Zealand team called the All Blacks, that's their nickname, and so you're seeing a bit of the haka, and actually the University of Hawaii football team uses a little bit of this. Um, <laughs> All males, some males and females, different situations. This is a Japanese no performance. Um, two different characters, they seldom even practice together, but they get together and they perform their dance. And finally, I can't resist just a little bit of the hula. But these are obviously really very, very different approaches. Um, to this, and we're trying to figure out how do you harmonize it? Is there some way of doing it, and what's kind of the fundamental approaches that we're looking at? Certainly in the Asian tradition, um, there's different approaches compared to American and Asian uh, conflict resolution, and because of where I work, what I do, and most of my teaching, my, my comparison is going to be mainly U.S.-Asia. Um, this is a focus on just conflict in general and perhaps negotiation, the viewpoint here. Um, the Western approach tends to be really very direct, attacking the problem directly head on, maybe going right into it, and the Asian approach is actually just kind of going around and looking at it from a different standpoint. And uh, let me also mention to you actually the current draft version of my paper as well as this PowerPoint presentation, if you ever want to take a look at it, is available on the fr uh, the first page of my website, and if you Google John Barkey and just put that in Google, the first hit will probably be um, my web page for you, and you could download that and take a look at that. Um, now, in the cross-cultural field, sometimes people talk about the emic and the ectic approaches. At least this is, comes from psycholinguistics, and a lot of it has to do with sounds from psycholinguistics, and it has to do with whether we have a, a sound that, is a, that is, appears only in one language or appears across in many different languages. And so to some degree, the material on cross-cultural um, um, 
negotiation, but particularly cross-cultural factors, has both an ectic and an emic approach. Some things come across and cut across all forms of culture, and I'll mention some of the ideas about that from Edward Hall and Gert Hofstede, and some are much more cultural specific, what to do when negotiating with the Japanese, Chinese, et cetera, and we'll take a look at that. Um, one of the things I like to use in negotiation and the conflict resolution is optical illusions. They're really fun for me. And I'm going to start by showing you the world's most famous optical illusion. My guess is 80 to 90 percent of you have seen this one. Um, well, that's the ectic image. How many of you are looking at this for the first time? Um, great. Um, always wonderful to have some people like that in the audience. I don't know where they come from. Uh, <laughs> been living under a rock, but it's terrific that you're here, and thank you for being here today. Um, and for, if you're looking at this for the first time, what do you see? Anybody? A young woman. OK, a woman. And you know it's a sensitive subject these days, especially in American legal culture. <laughs> but could you give me an age guesstimate here? And just simply, young or old? Young, OK. How many of you, when you kind of look at it for the first time, and even all of those of you who um, really know what we're talking about, how many of you kind of your first impression is to see a young woman? Raise your hand. How many of you is to see an old woman? Raise your hand. How many of you see two women? If you don't see two women, talk to the person next to you for 15 seconds and have them explain the two women. How do you see two women here? It's slightly interactive here. And if you see the young woman, she's probably looking away. That's an eyelash. That's the nose. That's the chin. Um, and that's the neck. And she looks this way. And if you're looking at the old woman, she looks this way. And this is a very big nose. This is the mouth. That's the eye. That's the chin. Um, this optical illusion is remarkably called young woman, old woman. Sometimes it's renamed old woman, young woman. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was uh, created in 1915 by a man named Hill, and it's, I think, the world's most famous optical illusion. And you say, very cute, but why are you using it here? Um, and the reason I'm using it here is that this, to me, is a wonderful reminder that we're all looking at things in what we'll probably say it's black and white. Everything here is black and white, right? It's really very obvious. But for some reasons, psychological reasons, whatever, that our background, experience, our culture, whatever, for some of us it organizes that, those pieces of information and says young woman, and for some of us it organizes it and says old woman. And so is there some way in which we can share that viewpoint? And I just call this, well, this is, the, this is a, another version in color. It makes it a little bit easier. But I call this about perspective or view. And what can you do in a negotiation and conflict situation to kind of change viewpoints, to help other people see other viewpoints if you're in the mediation situation, uh, or for you to change your viewpoint? I'll show you another optical illusion very briefly. When you look at this, what do you see? Clown, or I'm going to help you change your perspective. This is a 90 degree, 90 degree rotation, and if I n rotate it 90 degree, you get the whole circus. This is the tent, man on a unicycle, um, a dancer, uh, the ear has become a dog with a ball, uh, bareback riders on horse, standing up, jumping over hurdles, and elephants going nose to tail, nose to tail, nose to tail. Um, or this one. How many? Anybody here read this? Where I teach, I always get some people read it. What does this say? It says Tokyo. Um, you have to trust her. I can't even trust me. But this is the kanji. This says Tokyo. Um, now, if I change your perspective, what does this say? This also says Tokyo, T-O-K-Y-O. Uh, this is the kanji. This is the English. And one of the remarkable things about this is that when I show this to my Asian students and Asian business people who come here, when they see this, they read Tokyo. No problem. It's very easy for them. Um, even though they all read English pretty well, when I do this, they're stuck. They can't find Tokyo, at least for a while. And what I take that to mean is sometimes, because of your experience and special knowledge, you're actually trapped in your old frame of reference. And they can't move as easily from the kanji to the English. Um, and for all of us who can't read the kanji, well, we can see it in English quite easily. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that um, and how we're going to make that work. 
in a negotiation, this is one of my favorite negotiations. This is I call this is the big negotiation in the sky. The angels and the devils kind of doing that negotiation. Also, it's sort of like an international negotiation because often those are kind of team-based negotiations. Um, what's this about? I mean, imagine you're in this negotiation right now. Which side of the table do you see yourself sitting at? Um, most of us see ourselves on the side of the angels. We're kind of the good guys. There's probably a few of you out here who kind of see yourselves on the side of the devils, and that's the way you work. But typically in this situation, um, we think of ourselves as we're the good guys. We're using the right amount of emotion. We've got the right approach here, the right kind of logic. And what's the problem? It's the other guys. They're not doing it right. They're not seeing it correctly. They don't have the right viewpoint. So how can we make these kinds of switches, and what can we do? Um, so we go back to kind of the classic negotiation approach these days, um, some of the getting to yes and other kinds of materials, talking about interests, not positions, and interests clearly drive negotiations. Interests are what negotiations are about, and that's kind of basic negotiation theory, and I'm really not going to try and spend time in that spot. Um, I sometimes call this about the, the iceberg theory. Uh, the positions are what's above. Uh, the, uh, the rest of the iceberg and a lot of stuff is below. Um, if you spend time with the Pepperdine people in negotiation, one of their favorite phrases, I think, Peter Robinson uses this and a number of other people, they talk about below the line stuff. And so uh, the below the line with an iceberg is all that the rest of the mass here. And below the lines are sometimes huge and invisible issues. Um, things are purposely hidden. Sometimes they're simply out of awareness. And in addition to all the regular interest stuff, there's all the cultural dimensions that can come to play in this that we're not, not as aware of. Um, and interest, just to kind of redefine that a little bit more, um, if you know Maslow and hierarchy of needs, I'm not going to go there, but this is kind of the Maslow approach. What Maslow refers to as um, uh, needs, it really is the same thing as interests. And I think probably what sums it up best is this Chinese marital proverb that says, but, yeah, but because I can't read it so well. And when I do, it's not so well. But we really do have some. So could you just turn a little bit and say this louder for everybody so they can hear it? Exactly. Uh, uh, and that actually means same bed, different dreams. Same bed, different dreams. So it's often, I mean, it, it has to do with a marital family, but also applies to joint ventures. Come together, joint, we, we have the same bed, we've, we've uh, structured a contract, but we have different dreams, we have different goals, we have different interests. And it's kind of this interest approach that we're trying to figure out and how we're going to make, uh, make work for us in negotiation. And I, I do have one interest-based cartoon, um, and that's this one. This is, this is a new car salesperson show, trying to show this car to these three not necessarily reputable people, I guess, based on the way they're dressed. That's a stereotype, but we're looking at that. Um, um, and in, in our culture, we'd probably call these Mafia. Uh, uh, in uh, Japan, that'd be the Yakuza. They might be the Tong in China, whatever it is. But the caption is, and notice, gentlemen, this year's model has 20% more trunk space. Um, and so this is an appeal to the interests, right? They're trying to figure out why they want that vehicle. Um, not for the fast, fast vehicle, not for the leather seats, not for the great stereo. They want to put guns and bodies in the trunk and drugs and things like that. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, what are some of the conflicts that come up in uh, kind of a cross-cultural situation? Well, this is another Gary Larson cartoon. This is the aliens coming in from another world, meeting up with the farmer. Now, these aliens look a bit different. They're kind of like arms with a hand. And the caption to this one is, inadvertently, Roy dooms the entire Earth to annihilation when, in an attempt to be friendly, he seizes their leader by the head and shakes vigorously. Um, <laughs> And this just kind of explains how we misappropriate, we misapproach things, and we just don't use the right approach in a negotiation. Uh, we try, um, and if you do business with people from a different country, you do the best you can to kind of learn about their role, take on the role, and do whatever you can. And so I borrow my children, or use my children, as I do in this situation. I have nine-year-old twins at this point. Uh, they're, they're slightly different, but they are all American kids. Um, and they sort of look like this. This is kind of their, uh, their um, um, uh, American cheerleader uniforms. Um, sometimes they have them dressed up and looking very Japanese. And this is actually a photo called Shinichi Gosan, which has to do with Japanese tradition, um, where 
young children have their pictures taken at age seven, five, and three in kind of a demarcation of cultural stuff. Sometimes they try and be Chinese in a way, but the truth is they're still Americans. Um, and they have to negotiate their own conflicts. And if they were even serving as a mediator with people from a 